So our final scripture reading comes from the Psalms, and specifically Psalm 8, and it's the whole Psalm, verses 1 through 9. Uh, if you're reading along in a Bible, which I always welcome you to do, I've done a couple translation edits to be truer to what the Hebrew says, and if you have any questions about that, you can always ask me later why I chose, but mostly I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, but there are a couple words I wanted to make sure we, we heard in, 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 in their specific translation. O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark against your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are humans that you are mindful of them? Mortals, that you care for them, yet you have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas... O Yahweh, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we can say, thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Majestic creator, God, in this Christmas season, we are reminded of the hymn that Paul wrote in Philippians, that you did not see being God as something to the Lord and power over us, but that you entered into life and human flesh to live with us, to be God with us, and to be God for us. In these words, speak to us, Lord, that we, who you have called to be your children, who you have called into your body of Christ, might grow in grace and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Psalms carry some of the most human emotions in all of Scripture. If you read through them, there's this moments of uncontainable excitement, and there's moments of unfathomable grief, moments of hot anger at the injustice that we experience in life, and then, as we see in Psalm 8, this moment of confusion and joy at the mystery of the world in which we live. So let's start with just a brief meditation on this psalm. And I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And feel free if you need to relax in the pew a little bit and close your eyes to envision this moment. Feel free to do that. But when was the last time you shared in David's emotions in this question that he asked in Psalm 8, what are humans that God is mindful of us? Has that ever been a question on your mind, a moment where you've seen that and thought, or seen something and thought, what are humans that God would care for us? Where were you? What were you feeling in that moment? What were you sensing and smelling and hearing and seeing? And what prompted you to share this confusion with the psalmist? What are we that God should care for us? Take a moment and sit in that space when you've asked that question. I imagine this sort of question arises out of many incidents in our lives. The beautiful ones, the ugly ones, the good and the bad. Perhaps the last time you asked that question, you were watching the news unravel another story of greed or of hatred or of violence or of disregard. Or maybe you were gazing into the eyes of a child who had just learned something new and amazing, and you were taken back by the beauty of it all. Or maybe you were being held in the embrace of friends and family during a critical time. Or maybe you were feeling alone in the midst of some pain, and you were seeking a friend. Psalm 8, whether, whether written by David or written by some other person, we know the Psalms are this prayer book of the Hebrew people, and many are attributed to David, and this one is knows that moment, that moment when the enormity of all creation seems to lose us in its seams, 
as we struggle to understand how grandiose and minuscule our life can be at the same time, in the exact same moment, when we feel that we stand in the midst of the grace of God and sometimes feel that we live, but for a moment. About a week ago, I was standing outside our house in the field, and if you know how cold it was a week ago, I, I, I'm not sure why I was doing that, but I, I was standing there and I was looking in the sky because the sky was clear and you could see all these different stars and you could see the, the moon that was waxing but was still just a sliver in the sky. And much like the psalmist, I was just trying to stand there and appreciate the stars and the moon and to realize how incredibly small and brief this life that we have is. And then I came to my senses and realized it was three degrees outside and I was freezing and so I ran inside so that my life wouldn't be quite as brief and small. And then a few nights ago, I got to share in, a, in, in some hours of laughter and friendship with some colleagues from around the conference and with their children that they had brought as we ate and listened to music and we danced and we played games. And there was something you could feel in that brief moment that was eternal and universal, wisping through the room as we, in our brief lives, spent time together in love and grace. Who are we that God is mindful of us? What are mortals that God should care for us? Renowned pop scientist, he's not always considered a full-fledged scientist, but he was. Carl Sagan once said that the cosmos is within us, that we are made of star stuff, and we are a way for the universe to know itself. And that line, when I was thinking this week, reminded me of the lyric by Joni Mitchell that says, we are stardust. We are golden, and we are billion-year-old carbon. She wrote that line as she watched Woodstock 69 unfold as she was sitting in a hotel room in New York City. She had been prevented from coming to perform at the music festival. And she said that the concept that a half a million people could gather for three days of peace and love and music caused her to reflect on her faith. Now, that's a very generous view of what Woodstock was, and I'm sure it was more complicated than that. But the beginning of that song that she wrote, titled Woodstock, was a reference to the Beatitudes. She was in this moment where she was reassessing her faith in God. And her view of this gathering of people who were together, who were sharing, who were trying to kind of do this life together for three days was both optimistic and at times could feel a little bit unrealistic. Who are we that Godful, God is mindful of us? as we encourage and cooperate together, as we, as we do wonderful moments of love and cooperation together. And Joni Mitchell says we are stardust, and we are golden, and we are billion-year-old carbon. Joni Mitchell has what we might call a gracious opinion of these humans of whom God is mindful. I imagine that some of you have uttered the psalmist's words at the wonder of all the good that can be in us as we sit here together, at the young person giving up their day to help someone in need, at, at the person who's helping pay off another person's debts and helping to get them out of debt, at two children overcoming their perceived differences to become best friends, at each time we mark a momentous step toward forward for all humanity. Perhaps there are those wonderful moments where we see the good that we can do together, the good that has been placed in us that we get to act out day to day and we say who is this that God is mindful and present here but then there are the other moments right last year a few documentaries came out about the 30th anniversary of Woodstock the one that Joni Mitchell was not writing about in 1999 the wondrous the the 1969 that was supposed to be this wondrous example of human love and the contrast it made to its 30th anniversary I wasn't present for either, but I was alive for the second. Woodstock 99 was three days that felt full of violence and harassment and health and environmental crises and then a little bit of music. Buses were lit on fire. People were fighting and assaulted. A gang of entitled and aggressive people spurred on by the extreme heat began to cover themselves in mud and called themselves the mud people as they looted and fought and burned down anything in their wake at the festival. Newspaper descriptions of Woodstock 99 described all the worst aspects of human nature that we've come to expect to hear about in our daily life. It put these on display and all the things that give us pause and wonder, who are we who can do such awful things that God would care for us, that God would care for violent and hateful people bent on destruction rather than love? 
I wonder if some of us have quoted the psalmist when considering moments like this. Moments where we see all the bad that we can do as people. The ways that we can hurt one another and hurt creation and continue to destroy instead of love. Continue to harm one another instead of build each other up. There is a telling of the Christmas story we heard this week that goes something like this. You may have heard it preached. That we are so broken and so hopeless, and so awful, and so in love with selfishness and violence that God sends Jesus to make up for all the things that are wrong in us. Has anyone ever heard the Christmas story preached that way? If not, it's good, because friends, it's not the Christmas story that I often put forward. That's not my belief in why Christ comes and is incarnate amongst us, but sometimes it feels like that's the reason, right? That we just can't get it right, and we're just so lost But while I don't agree with the story, the telling of the story that way, I too have shed tears, looked at some of the pain that exists in our world, and asked, why, who are we that God is mindful of us? As you witness that awful moment, there's incredible potential in us, in us children of God, that we can create near divine moments of love and grace And then days later, we can participate in despicable moments of hatred and evil, whether at a music festival, or in a family, or throughout our whole society, or even in a church where we can be a bastion of love and care and sanctuary for people, or where a church can be a place that harms someone. Wherever people live together, our, 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 our brokenness, but also our beauty shows. And we might be lower than the angels, And we might be just a step above the demons. I'm sure you've seen those moments. Who are we that God is mindful of us? Psalm 8 puts it to poetry that we are the ones created first and foremost by a loving God who invites us to join in this wonderful world that God has made and to participate in the redemptive things that God is doing. That is the psalmist's answer, that we have dominion over the work of God's hands, that we are invited to join this God who creates so many good things, and to join in helping keep them good, and to help them flourish, that we are stardust, and we are golden, and we are called to be participants in the garden of the world that God has made. The mystery of Christmas offers us another answer to this question, who are we that God is mindful of us? that we are siblings of the God who sees the fullness of what we are capable of, the good, the bad, the beautiful, and the ugly. And God still chooses to enter that reality, to become flesh as Christ, to be with us, to become human and dwell among us, to do life with us, and to invite 12 and then hundreds and then thousands and then millions more to join that life with him. The good news of the incarnation of, the Christmas, of Christmas is that God has not forsaken God's children, that God in Christ wants to heal the worst things about us and invite us back into the relationship of grace and all the good that we are capable of doing when we join in God's vision for the world. But the message of the incarnation is far more wonderful. That Christ, too, became a little lower than the angels with us. Not just to heal us, but also to model for us what sort of life we fallible but good people can live in cooperation with God's grace. That Christ is both our redemption and the one who heals us, but he is also our example and our model for life. Because Christ, the person, the human, shows us what wonderful things we are capable of when we humble ourselves to join the creator, to become, to become stewards of the good that God has made. That we have been given dominion over God's hands, which gives us some honor and glory, but mostly reminds us of our humility that we are connected and dependent on a God who goes before. And Christ exhibits that life time and again. I mentioned earlier that I got to spend an evening with some friends, some fellow uh, 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 members of the Baltimore Washington Conference and a good friend of mine who's a pastor in Baltimore. And after this party that she invited me to, I sent her a text afterwards just saying, thank you for inviting us. It was so much fun. Everyone was so wonderful. And she said, I love bringing good people together. So at least she thinks I'm a good person, which is nice. Uh, 
She says, we all get, she says, I love bringing good people together and making us co-conspirators in God's grace. I thought that was a lovely illustration. My friend, Reverend Cassie, who's over at Salem um, Hispanic Church in Baltimore, calls us co-conspirators in God's grace. That when God sees us, the creation of his hands, God's children, we are invited to be co-conspirators, to be partners in a new world of love and grace. And Christ not only makes the way, but shows us how we may walk in it. What would it look like if in this new year, as, as, we, set, as we set resolutions, as we plan for new things, if we, if we tried to be more like co-conspirators with God, to be partners in a ministry of creation, what would it look like if in the new year we asked ourselves how, can the, in, how the incarnation, how the realization of who Jesus is, how that could empower us to live as siblings of Christ, not as servants of sin, that we may join in the work of God who is redeeming all creation, who is loving all people, who is healing all brokenness. What would this look like if we, as we look at the earth and think about the woodpeckers and our gardens and our, and our space that we are reminded that we are connected to this creation that God has made beautiful and given to us. How will we be co-conspirators in creation and the environment that God gives us? How will we be co-conspirators in a God who sees the lowliest and says, those are the ones whom I love, who comes and is born in a stable as a poor carpenter's boy? How would it look like for us to be co-conspirators with God who seeks justice and seeks equity and rightness for all people, including the vulnerable and the marginalized? How would it look like to be co-conspirators with a God who gives and gives out of great grace to join in the generosity of God towards all people? But most importantly, what would it look like to be co-conspirators with a God who is first and foremost loving kindness? For a God whose very essence is love, that he gives himself up for us, that he comes and lowers himself to be with us. How can we be co-conspirators with God in our relationships with our neighbors? My call for us that I believe the psalm is saying is, look how wonderful the world and the people and our very own lives God has created in us. Let us join those lives to the good one who loves us who made us, who redeems us, and calls us to be co-conspirators in a kingdom of grace and love. Would you pray with me? God, make us your children. The thing that you already call us, even when we are still making mistakes, even when we are still on the wrong path, remind us that we are your children. And as children, we are also co-heirs with Christ, as Paul has written. And as co-heirs, we are also co-conspirators in the world that you are wanting to break through. So keep our eyes set on Jesus, our model, the perfecter and author of our faith and our redeemer. That we might join the redemptive story you are telling here in our lives, in our world, and in our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.